emphasize the fact that a lot of additional information can be elicited by a simple bedside ultrasound when we're trying to differentiate uh, various pathologies for patients. I have no disclosures for this discussion. So using ultrasound, uh, this slide is specifically related to the neuro ICU, but it also can apply, as I mentioned, to any region of the hospital. We can gather a lot of information. I think most commonly people tend to think of ultrasound when they're looking at cardiac um, function. Uh, the idea of POCUS really came about from echocardiography and trying to make it a more uh, bedside skill. But you also, as we'll see in this talk, can look very thoroughly into lung function and lung pathology, as well as some uh, new neurologic uh, ambitions of POCUS as well. Abdominal POCUS is not necessarily a focus of this talk, uh, mostly because it's not something that I'm super familiar with, but there are a lot of uh, utility for that as far as we use like the fast exam in the emergency room and things of that nature but we won't get too much into that on this discussion. So some of the terminology review that we're gonna look at for POCUS and ultrasound in general, when we're looking at the probes and or the transducer, that's the end piece that we're using directly on the patient's skin um, to help us relay ultrasound waves back to the machine and give us the images that we're going to use. We'll look a little bit more at those probes on the next slide. Some of the other terms include hyper and hypoechoic. In ultrasound, hyperechoic is anything that has a high frequency of ultrasound waves. So it's going to show up as bright um, on our images. And uh, based on what you adjust the gain to, which is one of the, the points below that, you can either brighten or darken um, these relative terms. It's all based on a central point. So you can have a little bit of control over what looks hyper and hypoechoic, but on the whole, um, certain structures tend to be um, hyper or hypoechoic at baseline. Hypoechoic and controverse is mostly those that are dark on the screen. Depth, as you can imagine, really just uh, centralizes how deep into the body you're looking. Uh, so you can have very superficial depths when you're trying to place lines, things of that nature, versus a deeper depth when you are looking at um, the intrinsic organs and things of that nature. M mode itself is a specific type of um, ultrasound mode that helps us look at a single point in an anatomical structure over a period of time. And we'll look at what clinical implications that has for us. And again, we're gonna go into the various cardiac views in just a little bit. So this is a little bit more of what we were just talking about looking at those probes. Um, so in this diagram here, A is the linear probe. This one is most commonly used for vascular placements, whether you're doing subclavians, IJs, arterial lines, uh, but you also can use it for lung um, assessment as well. The curvilinear uh, has a wider surface area and can really um, elicit a broader range of ultrasound feedback because of that curved nature of it. This is really helpful for looking at deep organ structures intrinsically, like the kidneys um, is a prime example of when we would wanna use the curvilinear probe. And then the cardiac or phased array probe is the probably most commonly used. It's the square um, head probe that you see everyone using for fast exams, lung ultrasound. It can be a very um, mobile uh, probe as well. So one of the questions is when we're evaluating someone with new onset hypotension or um, any clinical change that we feel like cardiac evaluation is important, uh, we're going to be looking at five main cardiac views. There are more that are clinically associated, but these are the most commonly taught ones. And this is the probe that we're going to use. Um, I would ask the audience, I'm not sure if we can write in the chat or anything, but does anyone remember what we're calling this probe? So one of the views is cardiac, and then the other way we refer to it is the phased array. So with this probe, we're going to look at five distinct cardiac views. Um, what I will remind us of is that the uh, various views can be very different based on the anatomical arrangements of the patient. And we're gonna look a little bit into what these standardized views look like. So regarding probe placement, um, these are kind of the three standardized positions for probe placement. There are two various teachings as far as cardiac focus, um, and it all depends on the direction you point the indicator. The indicator is typically either a square or a line on one end of the cardiac probe. And I'll tell you why that's important on the next slide. In the um, emergency room version of POCUS, it commonly is the exact converse of the cardiac core critical care view. 
for the purposes of my discussion, I'm going to be discussing um, indicator directions in the critical care formatting, but just know that the emergency department frequently will use it in the flipped um, plane. So when we're looking at these probe placements, uh, position A, as you're seeing here, the common teaching is between the third and fourth intercostal space, um, and it's just to the left of the sternum. This is the view we're going to see both the parasternal long and parasternal short view from. And we'll look a little bit more at each of these in the next few slides. Probe B um, is the sub xiphoid or also known as subcostal four view. Um, and it's quite literally just below the xiphoid process where you flatten and look up under the ribs. And then probe C is the apical view. Uh, we will commonly talk about the apical four view. There is also an apical two, three, five view, depending on what segments of um, the aortic tree and things of that nature that you want to be evaluating as well. So this is a very poorly uh, sketched on a computer diagram that I drew. Um, it's something that I've found very helpful for myself and when I'm trying to mentally understand which classic views are supposed to be, or what are they supposed to be looking at anatomically. In general, the indicator as signified on these by the direction of the arrow placement tends to be perpendicular to the anatomic structures you are looking at. So for example, this is the apex of the heart down here, the base up here. If you imagine the patient having their right shoulder in this direction, finding the parasternal long view, the classic teaching is to point the indicator in the critical care view towards the right shoulder. When doing that, you get the perpendicular um, viewing of the anatomic cross sections of the heart. So if you draw a perpendicular line through the heart, what you run into is you see a segment of the descending aorta, you see the left atria, the aortic outflow tract, and the right ventricle. And then you also see a component of the left ventricle. That's an example that we'll look at in a little more detail as we go, but try and keep this image in mind just to, just to have a relative idea of what anatomical cross sections we're looking at when we are trying to use different sections of the probe. So to get into these views a bit more, I find it very helpful as you start to um, kind of delve into your own understanding of POCUS to have a, a good understanding of what normal anatomy and normal physiology should look like. Uh, it's one of the reasons we always say that when you're starting to learn POCUS, really just the more people you put a probe on, the better. You know, it's really triggering the uh, sensors in your brain to see something abnormal only when you've seen normal over and over and over again. So for that reason, we're going to look briefly at what normal structures look like. So this is the parasternal long view. Anatomically, this is that one I was just talking about in the cross section. So you have the probe facing with the indicator towards the right shoulder. By doing that, the perpendicular cross section gives us a little bit of the left descending aorta, I'm sorry, the descending aorta, the left atrium, the aortic outflow tract, and the right ventricle with some of the left ventricle entail. So again, on this side, this is the atria, aortic outflow tract, right ventricle, and then left ventricle. The parasternal long view is a really helpful view for a couple of reasons. One, it has very good visualization of the septal wall here. Um, and it also has important views for both the mitral and aortic valves. You can see um, valvular insufficiency, you can see regurgitation, you can see stenosis. And this is one of the views as we'll get into later, you can approximate ejection fraction from. You also can see with the right ventricular wall here that there is a, a segment that could have free fluid as in the cardiac effusion. Um, so this is one of the early places you can see an effusion collecting. So that's why the parasternal long view itself has um, a lot of utility. And we'll check on the next view here as the parasternal short. So anatomically, the parasternal long view um, was that cross section pointing towards the right shoulder. The parasternal short is the 90 degree view change. So you find that parent parasternal long view, you rotate the probe 90 degrees with the indicator now facing the left shoulder. And that gives you a cross section of both ventricles. So what I'll show you on this view is that the left ventricle itself is typically the higher um, pressure system. So it has a thicker muscular wall and it has the right ventricle, which tends to hug around the left ventricle in itself. That problem is um, 
or that gives us an indication that the left ventricle almost always has this circumferential shape. There are certain pathologies where the right ventricle may be under higher strain, and that can uh, start to flatten this wall, as we'll look at later. Um, other views this is really good for is segmental wall movement abnormalities, and we'll check that out when we look more at the physiology of this view. The apical four view itself um, is a four chamber view. This is from that, um, what most people refer to as the mid axillary line on the left. I will say having done focus on a lot of critical care patients that cannot cooperate to get into a left lateral DQ position. Most of my patients are on their back. Based on the location of the heart in the chest, typically that means you have to modulate your probe positioning a little bit and go more mid-clavicular as opposed to mid-axillary when you're trying to get this um, apical four view. So as far as probe placement for me, I typically start mid-clavicular or just below the nipple line. And instead of pointing straight down towards the spleen, I tend to angle up towards where I thought the heart was in those first couple of views. Um, and then you can modulate based on that. So the April 4 view gives us a four chamber view of left ventricle, right ventricle, left atria, right atria. And then you can see both the mitral and tricuspid valves. This is also utilized in ejection fraction calculations more on a machine-based status. And then finally, we have the subcostal four view. So this view, um, if you think about it, the most anterior chamber of the heart is the right ventricle. And so given that your probe um, is really referred to as the, the top point here, you're getting a cone of ultrasound wave from that top point. The chamber that should be closest to you is usually the right ventricle. So that makes this the right ventricle in the subcostal view, this the left ventricle, and then you can see both of your atria. The subcostal view is a really important view because it's used in the FAST exam. You can get a lot of really gross information from it um, based on how hard you press down against the abdomen. You can see all four views, depending on what, um, like I said, the pressure variations. And you also can see gross uh, ventricular function comparatively to each other, as well as gross atrial function. And probably one of the biggest um, helpful tools for the subcostal four is that this is the most sensitive view to find pericardial effusions. So we use it in the FAST exam in the context that there's could be a concern for uh, cardiac output obstruction or if someone has a cardiac tamponade. So this is that view you would use if you're concerned for a tamponade or a new acute obstructive outflow tract. And then the IVC view, I don't really have a picture of, but um, in general, it's the vessel that's coming into the right atria and you can look at IVC collapsibility, although that's not necessarily a perfect metric for volume status. It's just a, a surrogate number to help us assess. So I know that was a lot of talking with still images. I personally am a very visual person. So I'm gonna have us look at some um, videos here. There we go. So this is the peristernal long act looked at. Again, I'll reorient you with left atrium, outflow tract, right ventricle, left ventricle. And some of the things, whoa, I stole these videos from YouTube, sorry. Some of the things I want you guys to notice is this mitral valve, every time the heart is beating, is almost hitting the septal wall here. And then the last thing I want you to see is a concept that we call wall thickening. So you see this hyperechoic line at the base of the septal wall. That line should travel intraventricularly every time the heart beats because the left ventricle itself um, beats in a concentric constricting pattern that's controversial to the right ventricle that has more of a wave-like motion. But in the left ventricle with every beat, that wall should travel towards the center. So I want you guys to keep that in mind on this peristernal long view. And now what we're gonna look at is the peristernal short, if I can get this to cooperate, there we go. And so again, this is a really good representation of that concentric beating pattern where all segments of the left ventricle are coming towards the center at the same time. Um, what I meant by segmental wall abnormalities earlier is that if you look at the left ventricle and you mentally um, kind of divide it in the middle, and then I usually pick four to six sections, you wanna make sure that all sections of that inner wall are coming to the middle at the same time. If that's not the case, there's concern for a segmental wall abnormality 
which could mean new ischemia. It could mean that someone had an old STEMI. It could mean that someone is experiencing a neurogenic or a uh, demand uh, cardiomyopathy picture. Uh, so it's something for us to pay attention to. But I'll play this one more time as a, a function of normal left ventricular function. And then you also see that this right ventricle is wrapped around the LV, but it's not flattening this wall at all. There was truly a circular shape with no uh, pressure dynamic changes from the RV. And we'll look at some pathology a little later that can change that. Also, if anyone has any questions at any time, please stop me. I know I uh, tend to just rant on this stuff, so <laughs> happy to answer any questions. All right, so this is the apical four. This is that one where I was saying the classic teaching is the mid axillary line, but if someone can't cooperate or flip to their side, a uh, um, mid clavicular line is also a place you can start to look. And what we're looking at here is classic LV RV function with the LA and RA. We get the mitral and tricuspid valves. Um, what I want you guys to notice is again, this whole ventricular wall thickening, all segments are coming in towards the center at the same time, including up here at the apex. And then um, that both valves, oops, okay. Both valves have uh, free floating movement where they're making it approximately three quarters of the way up to the wall every time the heart is beating. Um, this is a really good view for uh, systemic function assessments. So if you're like determining someone hyper or hypo collapsible um, in a volume assessment, the apical four view can be very helpful. And then finally, we'll look at the sub xiphoid view or subcostal four. Again, this segment up here would be where you would see free fluid if there wasn't a fusion, but this is a grossly normal uh, function with the RV, the LV, and then both atria. All right, before we continue on, does anyone have any questions on normal an anatomy and function based on the cardiac views? Just type into the chat, guys, if, if you want to. All right, sounds great. So we're gonna continue on to look at some pathology now that we've seen some normal findings. So say we have a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, classic anterior communicating artery, relatively high grade bleed, and they're now post-coil day two, um, trying to figure out their different assessments. So if they're becoming hypotensive um, in a subarach patient, you have many different etiologies that could cause that. You could have new cardiac or pulmonary pathology, you could have sepsis, you could have wine induced issues. You know, there's a lot of things that could change. You start fluid resuscitating them, and yet they are still hypotensive, and their chest x-ray has some pulmonary edema. Right off the bat, does anyone have any differentials that they could think of um, given these different findings? Okay, so some of the ideas coming through here, we have heart failure as a, as a general concept. Um, and then also that patients that have like new sepsis or things like that might not necessarily be fluid responsive right off the bat. So we're gonna use our cardiac um, POCUS to help us differentiate what's going on. In this view, controversy to the normal anatomy we saw earlier, you can see a hypercontractile mid septal segment here with pretty much no wall thickening or movement of the apex. So this is known as apical hypokinesis or akinesis and what we call apical ballooning. This is a very classic pattern for neurogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's the reason that we call it Takasubo cardiomyopathy is for after the name octopus pot. And quite literally what that means is when this contracts, it looks like an octopus pot and that's where it got the name. Uh, but the Physiologic reasons we're going to look at on the next slide this is a very common pattern of injury, especially after strokes, subaracts, um, anything with a strong neurologic injury pattern. Um, and it can cause heart failure anywhere from immediate injury up to a week after. So we will look at the physiology of that, that apical ballooning. Um, no one quite knows entirely why this happens, but this is the most commonly proposed pathophysiology. And it has to do with both sympathetic and catecholamine surge at the time of neurologic injury. So the sympathetics themselves, um, they have a higher concentration in the mid-septal and lateral wall segments of the ventricle 
but there is really not much uh, sympathetic induction down at the apex. Catecholamines have pretty much consistent, oh, go back, wait, there we go. Um, catecholamines pretty much have um, consistent effects throughout the whole ventricle, but the problem is that the beta-1 versus beta-2 receptors have a different um, functionality. Beta-2, as we all know, is an inhibitory um, transmitter, and so the epinephrine is higher concentrated in beta-2 receptors at the apex of the heart. So you have an inhibitory pattern from the catecholamines in the apex, but you have an excitatory pattern from the sympathetic stimulation in the mid-septal segment. And that's the proposed mechanism for giving us that classic like apical ballooning or akinesis in the apex versus the mid-septal wall. I will say this is all theoretical. Everyone uh, that has neurogenic injury does not follow this in um, pattern of disease. It is, can really be any kind of heart failure that can be like a secondary stunning of the myocardium. This is just the most commonly and well-researched um, pattern that we've seen. So to look further into this, we can use some other views. Again, that was the apical four that was most commonly used. You also can see it on the parasternal short view. So controversy to our normal um, view where we saw all the walls thickening in towards the center, you can see that there's pretty much no actual movement of this wall, it's just quivering. These are the papillary muscles down here, which is a common um, divider between the mid-septal and the apical segments of the left ventricle. And so below the papillary muscles, when you start to see this lack of contraction, um, that should signify to you this is probably neurogenic in nature. And then finally, we're going to look at the parasternal long view. And again, it's really just an assessment of poor LV function. So before you saw these valves almost hitting the septal wall here, and you saw this wall really coming in and out. Now you can tell that there's very minimal movement of blood flow up through the aortic outflow tract because of the lack of contractility of that left ventricle. That brings us to the question of, does this affect ejection fraction? And how can we tell that on POCUS? Um, I am not a echocardiographer. I'm not a cardiologist. I have no idea how to actually calculate ejection fraction. I will say that right off the bat. That being said, this is one of the um, bedside tests that we can use to try and help elicit generally what the function is. Because at the end of the day, um, it's mostly correlative if it's normal, hypercontractile, or hypocontractile. We don't actually care about the number that much because clinically that might not make that big of a difference to us. But if we think their ejection fraction is somewhere around 30, that could change whether we try to use fluids versus vasopressors to help resuscitation. So this concept is endpoint septal separation. Uh, it's been studied since the mid 80s, but has the majority of its studies uh, founded in the early 2000s. Uh, and what you do is you use the M mode on ultrasonography, where it is a single line representing an anatomic uh, strip through the heart. So one cut through the heart, and you watch that segment throughout time. I'll show you an example on the next slide. And what you're trying to find is that antral, um, sorry, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, how close it comes up to that septal wall. Um, anything that's over seven millimeters, the literature says between seven and 13 millimeters is uh, correlative with severely reduced ejection fraction. So anything that's under about 30%, which could drastically change our clinical approaches. This equation down here is from one of the parent studies. Um, I'm not sure that people use that that frequently clinically, but it has been um, proven to be more correlative with this lower ejection fraction um, than just the seven millimeters. So to get into why this is the case, what we're looking at here is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So when this valve opens, it should be hitting uh, or close to hitting the septal wall. It signifies the, um, the end of systole and the start of diastole when the mitral valve opens. That's the E point is what we call. The A point is when you get that atrial kick during diastole as well. But this opening E point is significant to us because we want to know how close it's getting to the septal wall. And physiology wise, if you have a robust contraction, you don't have a lot of stagnant blood, right? You are pushing blood through your ventricular system, out your aorta, and it's continuing to move on. That constant flow of blood gives the mitral valve room to open up and let a new flush of blood in every time the heart beats. However, 
if there is a severe reduced ejection fraction, that blood is not leaving the ventricle. It's not going out of the atria, I'm sorry, out of the aorta. So there's no room for that mitral valve to open up against the blood that's already there. So what we call mitral valve excursion or the, as the calculation becomes the endpoint septal separation is limited. So it's conversely related to the amount of ejection fraction that you have. What I mean by that is when this valve opens all the way, you get a small distance between the E point and the septum. A small distance means good ejection fraction. If it can't move really at all, as we'll look again, then there's a huge distance between this wall and that valve, and it signifies that there's a lot of blood left. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, great. So we're just gonna look at this image one more time where you see this valve is really not making its way all the way up to the septal wall. And that's a function of there being a low ejection fraction in this patient that has a neurogenic cardiomyopathy. All right, so again, 0.7 millimeters is really our, our I'm sorry, seven millimeters is our key um, number there. Anywhere from seven to 13 is concerning for severely re reduced ejection fraction. And this is a look one more time at our apical ballooning in the neurogenic cardiomyopathy. All right. So moving on from our cardiac focus, which is probably, as I mentioned, one of the more frequently used um, varieties of focus, we can also evaluate different things like nuance at hypoxia, hypotension, if someone has sepsis. Uh, lung ultrasound itself can be a very high yield diagnostic tool, but of course it's never really used in isolation. Um, we use things like CAT scans, x-rays to better help us differentiate. But in an acute setting, especially if someone has a, like an emergent critical change, this can be really helpful to try and gather a lot of information. So back to our case, say the subarach is now close to day 13 and they're newly hypoxic, setting only 87%. We're escalating them on the nasal cannula. You might put an on-rebreather on. We really don't know what's going on. So we're gonna look at some of the pathologies on ultrasound. When you're doing lung ultrasound, um, there are a couple ways to determine what fields. Some people use this kind of six common fields here. Um, I'll show you the one after this that I usually use. The long and short of it is you can look at the lung lining really anywhere. Um, it's just hard to standardize what segments might be having um, issues. So that's what people have tried to do. Does anyone have a guess as to what probe we're going to use to evaluate the lung? Okay, so we can either use the phased array probe or the linear probe. Um, both have a very good window, window yield and can look through the ribs to reveal lung underneath. So the most um, utilized anatomical findings is called the blue points. This was a study done by a guy named Lichtenstein back in the early 2000s. And his objective was to try and standardize where we evaluate for lung pathology, but with um, minimal resources. So he started using this like two hand um, criteria where you place the lateral border of your left hand under the patient's clavicle, and then you overlie your thumbs on each other. So you're, all of your fingers line up just eight in a row. And you're using the midpoint of both hands as a way to signify the different lobes of the lung. So you'll have the anterior lobes, um, both bilaterally. Then on the left side, you can get the lingual from that middle point. On the right side, you get the middle lobe. And then um, you draw a perpendicular line onto the back, which you can see on this side. And that should give you your posterior lung fields or your inferior lobes of the lung. Um, so the blue points is most commonly used. Uh, there are a lot of terms with lung ultrasound, um, how much they really mean to us, I don't know, but I'll kind of go through uh, the more academic teachings of it. So an A profile is a essentially a normal lung profile. You have your classic uh, pleural lining shimmering. You have um, what we call A lines, which are a hypoechoic line that actually tracks perpendicular, I'm sorry, parallel to the pleural line itself. Um, and it's just a, a signification of normal airspace. Uh, some pathologies you'd see a normal A profile in are those that don't have actual like lung cortex abnormalities. So things like asthma, COPD, things that are more of a constrictive nature. An A prime profile, anytime you use a prime in determining the profile of a lung, you're talking about abolished lung sliding. 
Um, we'll look at some pathologies that that can be a part of later, but an A prime is, means that there's no cortical abnormality seen. There is just a loss of lung sliding. A B profile um, involves having B lines, which we'll take a look at in a minute, but it's a signification of pulmonary edema um, or interstitial fluid. And the common teaching is anything over three lines in one field of view is considered like positive B lines. B prime is when you lose that lung sliding but still maintain the B lines. And then uh, an AB versus C profile. A and B profile refers to one lung having normal ultrasound findings and one having abnormal. And then a C profile refers to when you see a consolidation or an infiltrate on ultrasound. And we'll look through kind of some of those findings. So this is an example of what B lines look like. Up here, I draw your attention to the pleural lining. So it's a hyperechoic line that is signified by the visceral and parietal pleura rubbing against each other with every respiration. Because of that, you get this sort of shimmering or sliding sensation. You can see every time it breathes, the lung line moves back and forth a little. Other things we're looking at here are the B lines, which are these bright jets of white hyperechoic lines coming down from the uh, pleural lining. And what it signifies is interstitial fluid having a higher frequency of ultrasound waves being reverberated back to the probe itself. So um, normal lungs do not have something that will conduct lines um, cross sectionally. Um, it only has A lines, which are in this um, plane. But the B lines having full fluid um, projects these lines from the pleural lining. Uh, so it's a sign of interstitial fluid. Uh, things we can see B lines in. Um, are unilaterally, you can see them in association with pneumonia, but you also can see them with um, just generalized interstitial fluid if someone's volume overloaded. Another way to help us look at pneumonia is called hepatization of the lung. And so um, a lot of ultrasound reverberance, it's dependent on how dense um, a fluid object is. So something that's very dense, like the liver here, um, tends to have a, a grainier, more gray uh, look to it. And you can tell that this feels, you know, more solid appearing than like, say, this structure in here, which almost looks empty. That's where fluid is flowing through. That's um, blood. But the liver itself has a solid appearing organ. The lung, typically, when it's not full of fluid, has almost a um, dark black um, air filled quality to it. But when you bog it down with a lot of fluid and a lot of interstitial junk called the neutrophilic um, inhabitants and things of that nature, it takes on the appearance of a solid organ. So the um, texture of the lung on this side, this is the diaphragm, the lung on this side of the diaphragm is similar to the liver on this side. And that's called hepatization of the organ. To differentiate between pneumonia and pulmonary edema, um, pneumonia, even though you can have bilateral um, infiltrates in like aspirations or a diffuse multifocal pneumonia, we tend to call a, um, a profound infiltrate more unilateral. So pneumonia is more likely to have an AV profile than pulmonary edema, which is a more diffuse process and is bilateral generally. Uh, both share the idea that they have B lines and both are characterized by a lot of um, interstitial edema as well as a possible effusion. One of the other things that pneumonia can do that pulmonary edema does not is it abolishes that lung sliding just based on the congestion profile right at the um, edges of the pleura. Uh, pulmonary edema does not do that. And then in pneumonia, you can also get what's called air bronchograms. Uh, and what that is, is a hyperchoic or a bright signification of the bronchus, which are typically dark and full of air. If they have a lot of junk in the alveoli surrounding them, they actually portray those ultrasound waves as a bright waveform as opposed to dark. They can either be stagnant or they can be mobile with respiration. Um, and it's a sign of a local infiltrate and alveolar congestion in that region. All right, so this whole loss of lung sliding we've talked about quite a bit here. Um, the common teaching is in regards to pneumothorax. It also can be seen in a pneumonia, as I mentioned. But this is what it looks like. Before you remember, we had this white line sliding back and forth. Now notice with every respiration, that line is just concaving and excaving. There's no movement sideways, um, signifying that there is no touching of the pleura there. You know, in order for an ultrasound wave to communicate um, anything that's below it, there has to be contiguous touch. And so 
the reason you have no beelines in a pneumothorax, even if the lung had fluid in it, is there's no longer that contiguous touch to relay the ultrasound waves back to the probe. So you lose the lung sliding and you also lose any beelines that would have been seen. Um, the classically taught signs with a pneumothorax, um, it's called either the barcode or the stratosphere sign. So in that M mode, which we had looked at for the um, ejection fraction approximation, it gives you a line that you um, let draw directly through the anatomy. And then with every, with that line of anatomy, it gives you the movement throughout time. So on a normal lung, you have the layers of the chest wall that don't have um, movement in association with uh, respiration, but you do have that lining right here between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura that is moving back and forth. So you get what we call a sandy beach sign or this kind of like punctated um, region where this is sand and this is sky. In a pneumothorax, as I mentioned, that connection is no longer there. You no longer have the visceral pleura touching the parietal. So you just get this continuous streaking effect throughout called the barcode or the uh, stratosphere sign. And this is used with MO. All right, another um, thing that we look at for ultrasound is ideology of pulmonary embolus. Um, so this could be a reason for new hypoxia. But because a pulmonary embolus is actually a function of pulmonary vasculature being obstructed, as, and it's a VQ mismatch as opposed to a interstitial uh, lung problem, we actually use cardiac pocus to evaluate whether someone has a PE or not. I will say that the most common cardiac pocus findings on someone with a PE is actually normal. They have to have a very profound um, sub-segmental to saddle, I'm sorry, segmental to saddle PE in order to have any cardiac pocus findings. If they do have pocus findings or official TTE findings, it's actually a, a higher indicative point that they should probably go to thrombectomy. And it's one of the things that like the um, PE teams usually use as a uh, reception point of if they need to take them or not. So that being said, we're looking at two different cardiac views here to evaluate for pulmonary embolus. On the left side, this is the parasternal short view. This is the one where I was saying you usually have just a concentric left ventricular circle with a pretty collapsed um, hugging right ventricle around it. In this, you can already tell before I play it that the right ventricle is much more dilated than we're used to seeing. And when I play the video, I want you guys to pay attention to the dynamics of this wall right here. You can see that because this is under higher strain, you'll get a flattening of this wall. This view over here is going to be the subcostal four view. And what we're gonna look at here is compared to a normal physiology where the left ventricle tends to be one and a half um, width of the right ventricle. The right ventricle in this view, which is gonna be this top chamber, excuse me, is uh, very prominent and is um, having a decreased contractility to it. All right, so I'm gonna play this. There might be volume. Oh, there we go, okay. All right, so again, I'll play it a couple times for us here. We're looking at the flattening of this wall. You can see how every time it contracts, this wall flattens in, signifying that this top ventricle is very high pressure. And then over here, you can see how this wall, this outer wall is not actually contracting in signifying that the right ventricle does not have, um, has a new um, elevated pressure load than it did prior. Um, and this is kind of cool because these are actually focus images that I had on one of our patients um, from a couple months ago that ended up having a saddle pee and went for a thrombectomy. Um, so that is the way that you can look at a pulmonary embolus on POCUS. And then the final sign um, that is kind of pathognomonic for a PE is called McConnell sign. This is an indication of acute drastic right heart strain. So someone that has like a chronic right heart strain problem where they have like pulmonary hypertension at baseline or something like that, you would not see a McConnell sign. Uh, this is kind of similar to the like shock idea of when we look at neurogenic cardiomyopathy where the uh, mid septal wall here is so stunned that it's unable to really contract inwardly because it has so much new volume to care for. And the actual sign itself is this hypercontractile wave at the base of the, I'm sorry, at the apex of the right ventricle. 
So this like aggressive contraction is significant for an acute uh, right ventricular strain. Uh, this is called McConnell sign and it's very specific to pulmonary emboli. Uh, the reason that you get hypercontractility here is because as I mentioned, the RV sort of contracts in a wave-like motion compared to the LV, which is concentric. And so when the mid-septal segment is stunned, the um, apex itself tries really hard to press down against the septal wall, but it really only hits the mid-septal segment. And so you don't get effective cardiac output despite having an apical hyperkinesis. All righty. Does anyone have any questions on long pocus right now? Okay. So we'll move on um, in the last seven minutes pretty quick here um, to how we're gonna use POCUS in neurologic evaluation. Uh, this is something that's gained a lot of traction in the last 10 years. Um, and specifically the two things we're going to look at are TCDs and optic nerve sheath diameters. So if you're looking at a patient that's like possibly day nine, they're sort of in their high um, spasm window. They have a new right low extremity weakness. They're newly confused. Pro, uh, bonus points to anyone that can guess the vessel that we're concerned about spasming. All right, it's the left ACA uh, based on that right lower extremity weakness. But so spasm is one of the things that crosses our mind pretty immediately with this subarachnoid patient. So we're gonna look at um, evaluating vasospasm using TCDs. Uh, TCDs, say what you will about them, they do have a strong predictive correlation with radio radiographic spasm. There's not necessarily a high correlation with clinical vasospasm. Um, that being said, the kind of overall mantra for both types of neuro ultrasound is that it's very user dependent. Um, so for example, in our institution, we have one tech who pretty much does all of our TCDs. Um, we try and do them ourselves on the weekends, but we usually get very drastic results. And a lot of that is just um, user error. Um, so something to be cautious of if you're reviewing velocities and they seem very drastically different, a lot of this is user dependent. When we're looking at TCDs, we're going to use this probe, uh, which is our cardiac or phased array probe. We are typically trying to find the mean velocity, um, but you can also look at the peak systolic velocity or some people look at um, peak septal variations. Um, and the Lindergaard ratio is a comparative of the main vessels, so the ACA and MCA, in comparison to the ACA, which has um, typically is, is less common to spasm, just given the location you look at it, it tends to be a very proximal ICA. Um, and we compare those ratios. Uh, I was reading some new literature about this arteriovenous index, um, and it kind of the idea is to eliminate that um, questionable variation if the ICA is spasming itself. Um, that being said, it is not as specific for evaluating someone that has a proximal spasm or has like a low flow state from their spasm. Um, and it's looking at the MCA versus the van of Rosenthal. Um, so it's just something that there's a little bit more research out there about it, but still the standard of care is looking at uh, the Lindegaard ratios and the mean velocities. In regards to what our normal velocities are, um, for the ACA and MCA, we use similar um, speeds. Uh, the moderate vasospasm, we tend to say is over 140 centimeters per second um, and severe really only like two, over 200. And that's supposed to be over 50% narrowing. That being said, uh, I think probably the most important thing to think about is the trend of these. So just because a patient has uh, TCDs that are in the like one teens, um, if their baseline was like in the seventies, um, and they have any kind of clinical change, I think it's more concerning, um, and should elicit further imaging, like a CT perfusion or something like that, even if they don't technically meet our vasospasm categories. Uh, the basilar tends to be a little bit, um, higher pressure at baseline, about 90 centimeters per second, and anything over 115 is considered spasm. And then with our Lindegaard ratios, we usually look at three to four as mild spasm, five to six as moderate, and over six as severe spasm. Again, that's comparing, um, comparing, comparing the MCA to the uh, proximal ICA. So when we're obtaining TCDs, uh, there are a couple of windows we use because as one can imagine, it's very hard to ultrasound through a thick skull. Um, so we use uh, four technically predominant regions. 
uh, the terion where all of the um, frontal and like the various cranial bones meet here is a very thin segment of the skull. So that's actually where we try and find uh, most of our vasculature. And the circle of Willis um, very correlates very nicely with the location of that. When you're looking at the circle of Willis here, uh, something to remember about ultrasound in general is when you're on Doppler flow, uh, red does not mean artery and blue does not mean vein. It's all about directional flow in relation to your probe. So if you're looking at the circle of Willis from here, you typically will have one side, if I'm on the right side, the side that's going to the left will be signified as away from my probe. And the side that's coming towards you on the right will be towards my probe. So you get something like this, where you have a red or blue towards you, red or blue away from you. It depends on the settings of your ultrasound, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. So what you would do is you would select one of the vessels, for example, the MCA, you put your marker there and it gives you this pulsatile waveforms looking at various velocities. Uh, they sort of look like this, and we'll look at more of them on the next slide. The vertebral basilar segment, you would look uh, posteriorly. It's kind of just at the base of the skull under the occiput is where you'll want to look for that. And then some people use a submandibular location for um, finding the proximal ICA, so you're not getting this confound uh, spastic risk up at the circle of Willis. You'll use a more proximal segment. You also can use a uh, paraphthalmic view. Uh, I don't really know too much about that. And I don't think that that's one of the more standardized ways to look at IC or TCDs. I think typically that's just if you really have terrible windows um, in your terrain bone. So why do we look at this? Why do we care about velocities through the blood vessels um, in the context of subarach? So patients that have um, higher velocities tend to correspond with lower um, circumference or diameters. So this is called the Bernoulli principle. Uh, I'm sure it brings back lots of lovely memories from physics way back when. Uh, but the general idea is that the smaller the circumference of a tubular object, the faster that the, um, the medium that's flowing through it, whether that be air, whether that be fluid, has to travel in order to maintain that space. So lower caliber of vessel equals higher speed of flow. Why do we care about that? Lower caliber vessel in large vessel vasospasm puts people at high risk for um, strokes and for DCI or delayed cerebral ischemia. So when we're looking at the actual waveforms of a TCD, this is commonly what we see from like a high resistance or a spastic waveform. Um, the way you think about it is if you know anything about A-lines, you have your systolic peak, you have your dichrotic notch, which is the transition from systole into diastole, and then you have your end diastolic phase. Um, it is pretty much the exact same thing because all we're doing is measuring blood velocities now as opposed to just um, the pressure itself. And so you have the, um, a really high um, and sharp peak for someone that has a high resistance waveform. And as that um, diastolic phase starts to relax, if you have a distal obstruction, so if someone is spasming distally to where you're measuring, you don't quite meet midline of that relaxation because there's too much blood being um, reverberated back towards you from that constriction for you to have a um, mid-level pressure. So the one third of the waveform is significant for someone that has a distal high resistance. If someone has proximal spasm to where you're measuring, you almost see like if an A-line is dampened because there is a, a constriction of flow before you that you get sort of these rolling hills. So this high resistance waveform corresponds to distal vasospasm um, and signifies poor diastolic relaxation uh, during that time. This is an example of vasospasm on angiogram. So uh, we have a resident in our institution that is famous phrase is if you don't say the word ratty, did you even talk about an angiogram? And so as you can see on this left side here, I would call these vessels a little ratty. You know, we have this quote unquote bead-like uh, change in the vessel caliber. Um, and you can see that there's poor distal flow in some of these segments here. Uh, this is an example of why that Bernoulli's principle would have higher velocities in this segment here because you have distal obstruction bilaterally versus after you get treatment from an angiogram, whether it be intraarterial verapamil or milrinone or anything like that, you can see that there's a lot more plump uh, vasculature on both sides. All right, any questions about TCDs? Okay, so the final topic of this lecture, and 
thank you guys for bearing in there with me. I know this is a lot of ultrasound in a very short amount of time. Uh, but the final thing we'll look out here is the um, evaluation of elevated ICP. So the way we can do this with POCUS is by measuring the optic nerve sheath diameter. The probe we're going to use for this is the linear probe. I will say, if you're going to do this to your patient, please put a tegaderm over their eye first so you're not just squirting jelly directly into their eyeball. Less fun. So what you're looking at here, and the reason this works, is there is a contiguous space between the CSF space and the optic nerve sheath itself. So this helps us generally evaluate elevated ICP because it's a, like, um, a continuation of that pressure segment. And if there's pressure high in the head, then it will push fluid out and cause an increased diameter of that sheath itself under higher pressure. It is not the most well supported by research at this time. Um, it's something that people have like feverishly tried to make um, a very promising clinical skill. And the reason is that there are a lot of like institutions in the world that only have access to something like ultrasound as opposed to EVDs or an intracranial monitor. For those patients that there's really no other way to assess ICP, it can be an important um, skill. That being said, the numbers have not been really well delineated, delineated in research. Uh, so it tends to be more the trend that we wanna look at as opposed to the direct number itself. Again, it's very user dependent and the number we most commonly use if we had to pick one is six millimeters. Um, anything six or beyond is considered to correlate with a high ICP. So when you're obtaining the optic nerve sheath, um, you're either placing your wrist on their uh, cheekbone or on their forehead, depending on what direction you wanna do it. And you're trying to get this view over here. We have the globe of the eye, you have the fovea here, you have the optic nerve, which is this dark structure in there. These lighter structures surrounding it are the retrobulbar fat pads. And then you have the external lining of the sheath, which is that other dark line. And where are we gonna measure it? So the outer edges of this hyperechoic band, so the outer segments of the retrobulbar flat, fat should be where the um, nerve sheath itself has dilated to. So that's typically what we want to measure from, as you can see from this side to that side. And then we standardized it by saying we want to measure three millimeters down from the fovea. And so that's typically where you want to um, where you wanna try and draw that horizontal line. If there is no um, like retrovulvar fat visible, if it's just like hypoechoic, it's just dark, you can measure right up until the edge of both sides of the dark um, and presume that that's what we're looking for here. Um, all in all, as I mentioned, studies aren't the most supportive for this. Um, some of the data shows it's anywhere from like a 90 to 94% sensitivity, 87% specificity. Um, so generally using it with caution, but um, trying to use it as just one factor in evaluating your patient's status. Um, we have used the SONAR unit frequently when patients are unable to get intracranial monitoring. For example, if someone has like a bilateral hemicrany and we can't do both, then we'll often use optic nerve sheath just to trend out and see what direction they're heading. So in summation for kind of this whole talk, uh, POCUS is a really useful bedside skill. Um, it's something that you improve with with practice, and there is a lot of courses out there that you can help um, kind of educate yourself with it. Uh, but on the whole, neuro, neurology in general, um, a lot of our resident services are not trained in it. Um, it just recently became a criteria for the Neurocritical Care Fellowships. Um, so it's definitely an education gap in um, neurology specifically. Most other ICUs are ran by anesthesiologists, cardiologists, people that have been using POCUS since they were interns. Um, so that I think makes it a very unique uh, field for us as APPs to become more involved in. Um, it's something that we can really become a consistent force with in our units and on our floors and it can really help change patient outcomes and can change uh, the way that we look at different problems. So. I'm a big supporter of it. Uh, with that, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come and listen and 